issues. A classic example of the rights of particular mascot groups overriding the rights of others are cases involving people with contagious diseases, including fatal contagious diseases. The landmark Supreme Court case in this area involved an elementary school teacher with active tuberculosis who was fired because of fears that she might infect the children she taught. The teacher sued, charging discrimination against the handicapped in violation of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. A majority of the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that it was indeed discrimination because tuberculosis could be considered a handicap. Although the school board argued that the teacher was fired not because of her impairment, but because her presence threatened the health of others, Justice Brennan, writing for the majority, refused to accept that distinction. Arlene's contagiousness and her physical impairment each resulted from the same underlying condition, tuberculosis. It would be unfair to allow an employer to seize upon the distinction between the effects of a disease on others and the effects of a disease on a patient and use that distinction to justify discriminatory treatment. The bending of the law for mascots has as its counterpoint the presumptive guilt of target groups, such as employers, who would seize upon excuses to fire people. The fate of innocent third parties, such as school children, carries little weight when taking sides with mascots against targets. As in so many other contexts, such taking sides provided an occasion for assertions of the superior virtue and wisdom of the anointed as compared to the benighted. In Justice Brennan's words, the law's purpose was to combat the effects of erroneous but nevertheless prevalent perceptions about the handicapped, to ensure that handicapped individuals are not denied jobs or other benefits because of the prejudiced attitudes or the ignorance of others. He repeatedly characterized others' responses in such terms as reflexive reactions, mythology, and prejudice, stereotypes, or unfounded fear. Since the term handicapped covers such a wide range of conditions, even in its normal usage, quite aside from Justice Brennan's extension of the term to people with tuberculosis, almost any blanket statement about the handicapped is virtually certain to be wrong. So is any blanket statement about how mistaken or malign the benighted are in their particular assessments of the individual cases they encounter firsthand. But although the term handicapped is, if anything, even less precise than vagrant, there is no danger that laws favoring the handicapped would be declared unconstitutional as void for vagueness, for such laws promote the vision of the anointed, and laws against vagrancy go counter to it. Even if medical experts were to certify that the tubercular teacher in question was a danger to the health of the children, thereby permitting her to be removed from the classroom, the law protecting the handicap required that she be considered for other assignments for which she was otherwise qualified. The Supreme Court sent the case back to the district court to determine whether the teacher in question was otherwise qualified to be kept employed by the school system. Homosexual activists greeted this Supreme Court decision with approval because of its possible implications for those with AIDS. Although AIDS was not at issue in this particular case, Justice Brennan, in a footnote, left open the question whether AIDS carriers might also be considered as handicapped people entitled to the same legal protections. Judges, by and large, have adopted this same vision of the anointed in dealing with cases involving AIDS. While public health officials have for decades traced the sources of other infectious diseases to those individuals who are carrying such diseases and spreading them, tracing AIDS to its sources has been declared a violation of federal laws protecting the handicapped. A jail inmate with AIDS who was kept separated from other prisoners was awarded $155,000 in damages. A three-judge panel ruled that the Department of Health and Human Services could cut off $107 million in federal funds to a medical center which merely restricted the duties of a pharmacist with AIDS. In courtrooms as elsewhere, AIDS carriers have become mascots of the anointed. No group has so polarized the anointed from the benighted as people infected with the AIDS virus. In keeping with their having performed this vital role, AIDS carriers are treated as the most sacred of the mascots. In contrast to the identification, and sometimes even quarantine, of people infected with other deadly and contagious diseases, AIDS carriers have been guaranteed anonymity by both law and policy as they mingle with unsuspecting members of the general public. From the beginning, various medical and other public officials have been preoccupied with reassuring the public on how they cannot get AIDS. As late as 1983, people were being reassured that their chances of catching AIDS from transfusions of untested blood were extremely remote. 
Secretary of Health and Human Services Margaret Heckler went on nationwide television on July 3, 1983, to assure the American people that the blood supply is 100% safe. But just one year later, the Centers for Disease Control began reporting dozens of cases of people who caught AIDS from blood transfusions. And just two years after that, the AIDS deaths from blood transfusions were in the thousands. More than half of the nation's 20,000 hemophiliacs were infected with the AIDS virus as a result of the numerous blood transfusions they require. The long incubation period of the disease proved to be like a time bomb. The problem was not simply with what medical authorities did not know at the time, but with what they presumed to know and to proclaim to the benighted, to those who, in Secretary Heckler's words, had irrational fears and unwarranted panic. Looking back on this period years later, a feature story in U.S. News & World Report noted, Americans have long believed the blood supply to be safer than it is. In a 1983 joint statement, for example, the Red Cross and two trade groups representing most other blood banks, the American Association of Blood Banks and the Council of Community Blood Centers, put the risk of getting AIDS from a transfusion at about one in a million. In fact, it was at least one in 660 and up to one in 25 in high exposure cities like San Francisco. Mistaken beliefs about the safety of untested blood did not originate with the public, but with the anointed elites. This was only one of the many ways in which these elites poo-pooed the dangers from AIDS. San Francisco nurses who used masks and gloves while handling AIDS patients were punished by hospital authorities for doing so in 1985, though such precautions later became accepted and then officially recommended in federal guidelines. It was at one time triumphantly proclaimed that no healthcare worker had ever contracted AIDS from patients, but by September 1985, there were the first of many cases of nurses, lab workers, and others who caught the disease from AIDS patients. And by 1991, there were cases of patients who caught AIDS from a dentist. As Newsweek noted, just a year ago, most authorities on AIDS considered it virtually impossible for an AIDS-infected physician or dentist to pass the virus on to patients. Precautions to protect the public from AIDS carriers have repeatedly been backed into only after new revelations devastated previous reassurances. The fundamental issue in all this is not why medical authorities were repeatedly mistaken, but why this disease was approached in a way directly the opposite of the way other contagious and potentially fatal diseases have been approached. Instead of erring on the side of caution in defense of the public, as with previous deadly and infectious diseases, Responsible officials approached the spread of AIDS by making the protection of the AIDS carrier from the public paramount. One political reason has been fear of offending the organized, zealous, single-issue homosexual organizations and their allies in the media, in the American Civil Liberties Union, and in other liberal bastions. But this only raises the further question as to why the interests of carriers of a deadly, incurable, and contagious disease should be regarded in such circles as preemptive over the rights of hundreds of millions of other people. The answer to this more fundamental question seems to be that AIDS carriers meet the criteria for a mascot group, sharply differentiating the anointed from the benighted. One of the arguments for maintaining the anonymity of AIDS carriers is that otherwise they will be driven underground and become more dangerous. But anonymity laws make them underground to begin with and maintain them in that situation even when some others discover that they carry a dangerous disease but are deterred by heavy legal penalties from warning anyone else. One rationale has been that the counseling received by AIDS carriers as part of their treatment will make these carriers more careful not to spread their disease to other people. This view, expressed by the New York Times among others, would certainly be in keeping with the vision of the anointed as contrasted with relying on incentives, as in the tragic vision. Since the AIDS carriers are already fatally infected, the only incentives likely to be effective are those operating on the healthy population, who have every incentive to safeguard their own health, if the anointed do not prevent them from doing so. Some indication of how much havoc can be wreaked by just one person with AIDS who does not choose to respond to counseling can be illustrated by the case of a homosexual airline steward who flew around the country infecting others with AIDS in gay bathhouses. As of 1982, at least 40 of the first 248 homosexual men found to have AIDS had either had sex with this steward or with someone else who had. He lived for two more years with an active sex life, 
Despite knowing that he was infected with AIDS, and despite entreaties, warnings, and even threats, after having sex in the dim lights of a gay bathhouse, he would turn up the lights to show his partner the lesions on his skin and say, I've got gay cancer, I'm going to die, and so are you. Although medical authorities in both the United States and Canada knew who he was and what he was doing, they were legally prohibited from warning anyone. Other AIDS carriers also continued to have sex, and some have deliberately bitten prison guards or policemen trying to arrest them in order to infect them. Once infected, the incentives to stop were zero, except for those with consciences. Again, doctors and others fully aware of what they are doing are prevented by severe penalties of the law from warning anyone. Yet the New York Times editorially supported parole board's decisions to parole various AIDS-infected prisoners as soon as they served the minimum term for eligibility for parole, but only if they disclosed their condition to those on the outside who might be imperiled. How anyone could enforce such a requirement was left undisclosed. Feasibility questions often have a low priority in the vision of the anointed, and mascots have a high priority. Many of the same people who spread alarm over remote possibilities of dangers from pesticides or nuclear energy are among those most willing to accept dangers from AIDS carriers. Mascots are treated differently from targets.